Okay, so in the first few lectures in this deep learning, you, was, were, uh, you were getting familiar with image classification, how neural networks can help you with, yeah, I've seen the previous talk, I've seen how many cats you've seen already, so uh, I promise you there will be a few dogs as well, or dog lovers. <laughs> So yeah, so we pretty much, I think like all of us are pretty much familiar with uh, image classification for now, but what if we have much more complex scene with multiple objects and what can we do? So there are different ways, like there are different recognition problems computer vision scientists are looking for as of right now. So one of them is called semantic segmentation. I will be covering it and that just solve a classification problem for each pixel on the image. So for each pixel, we decide what category it belongs to. Then the next problem is bounding box object detection, where we try to find and identify all, all, all objects of the certain classes and then delineate them with bounding boxes. Next, a bit more involved uh, thing is instant segmentation there. Instead of just bounding boxes, we again found objects and delineate them with masks. And finally, what computer vision community is working on is, as of right now, is panoptic segmentation as well, where we just try to predict both instance and semantic segmentation together. We'll cover it a bit later. And there is more to recognition problems in computer vision. So if you're unhappy with just boxes and uh, masks, then you can get key points for human pose. If you're not happy with just key points, you can get poses and like align that each person with a dense pose, basically with canonical shape of the human. And then if you're not happy with 2D, you can go to 3D and then recognize not just masks of the object, but their uh, meshes as well. There will be a lecture on 3D geometry that will cover this kind of work uh, tomorrow. Okay, so now we will go through this uh, through these topics. First, starting with semantic segmentation. Oh, by the way, if you have any questions and anything is unclear, please do stop me and ask, and I'll be more than happy to answer. Okay. Uh, so semantic segmentation again. What our task is label each pixel with semantic category. So. Before, we just had a cat. We had a category for the whole image. Now, for each pixel, we have a category like grass, cats, sky trees. I think it's pretty clear. OK, now, we have a like, few important properties of semantic segmentation. First of all, it's a predefined set of semantic categories. So the same thing as a classific like image classification. But also, important property that distinguish it from other recognition problems that we'll cover later is that it does not distinguish different objects of the same semantic class. So if there are multiple people on the image, they all will have the same semantic class. So here, like a uh, label for this pixel, label for this pixel are absolutely the same. Okay, and so computer vision uh, research as of right now, we're focusing on common objects and context, trying to segment everything on the image, or some egocentric view, finding the drivable areas on the images, trying to help uh, autonomous driving, and so on. But also semantic segmentation is used in other applications as well. So that's it. I'm not an expert in any applications other than common objects and egocentric view, but there are a few papers that people do segmentation and detection for brain tumors, and then there is one papers from physicists there they try to analyze their scans i guess and segment uh, em particles and track particles i have no idea but they 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 do use semantic segmentation and please check it out how people use semantic segmentation for this thing so okay how now we know what's the problem we know that it used almost like lots of different application for it so how will we solve it actually well, as I said, we just need to classify each pixel on the image. So as we already have image segmentation, uh, image classification network, let's just use it for each patch of the image. Now for is, this pixel, we predict cow. For this pixel, we predict cow. For this pixel, we predict grass. 
Nice. So it's the sa exactly the same network, right? The problem here that first of all, it's very slow. So because you need to get all the patches and create classes. So solution for that is actually as our networks are full of convolutions and convolutions do not care about your input size. So if you use convolution for the bigger image, what you get is a bigger output. So that's it. So in principle, most part of our networks that just convolutions, so they can be applied to any input image. And that's nice. So let's try to use this property. So that's a schematic uh, architecture, any architecture of modern uh, CNN. So you probably have seen this scheme already. So there are first like a few convolutional blocks that operate on different levels, uh, on different image resolution, and they're fully convolutional. So you can apply them to any input size, right? So if you apply it to the bigger image, then here you'll just get bigger output. So instead of seven by seven, there will be something bigger. So what is not fully convolutional here is the head of the network. So what we do with our seven by seven by seven by seven is a spatial resolution, 1024 is our channels. We do, we first flatten them and then use FCs, uh, like a few fully connected layers to process them and finally output the number of classes, right? So, and this thing is clearly not fully convolutional. So if you apply the same thing to the bigger image, what will happen? There will be more than seven by seven by 1024 channels here. And then this fully, con fully connected layer will not work because it expects to have exactly this number, which is, by the way, multiplication of seven by seven by 124. Uh, so that will not work. So what we'll do to make it fully convolutional is a pretty simple transformation. So instead of flattening, flattening things out in uh, this layer, we will leave it as it is, so seven by seven by 1024. And now we'll present our fully connected layer a simple one by one convolution, uh, that, not one by one, sorry, seven by seven convolution that goes from 1,024 1, channels to 4,096. So, and again, it's absolutely the same weights. So we just, FC just has this number of weights applied to all features here. And the same thing happens here. So it's the same number of weights applied to the same number of features, I'll put in the same number of features. So nothing has changed. We just change the way we represent our weights. And then we do the same thing with all uh, fully connected layers later on. So instead of just seeing it as FC, we see it as a one by one convolution with the same channel dimensions. Is this transformation clear? Hopefully, right, simple, nice, okay. So now the whole network is actually fully convolutional. So we can do stuff with it. Uh, exactly the same weights, nothing changed, and it can be applied to any input image. First, uh, given an input image of the same size as original, as original classification network, we got seven by seven here, and then we got one, one by one in the end. So that's happened with our padding zero here. So we just apply one seven by seven convolution here and straight one. If we increase our padding, so we don't want to have like pixel segment uh, class in the very center, but in all locations in the seven by seven, we just increase padding here. So we not just use the seven by seven thing, but we pad it from all parts. And now we can use seven by seven convolution in all location of this seven by seven feature map. So that gives us instead of one by one, that gives us seven by seven and that seven by seven goes on. So now for input image, we have seven by seven semantic, uh, seven by seven classification. And now you can use it for bigger images. So if you use a bit bigger image, you get instead of seven by seven, you get eight by eight. If you get two times bigger image, instead of seven by seven, you get 14 by 14. So that's an easy way to just apply your classification network, the same classification network that was trained on ImageNet, whatever classification network right now, all CNNs we use are actually the same. They use the same like stages. They've, stages are different, but it's also like four 
five different stages with different resolutions go into smaller resolutions. So you can apply any of that and then give an image. It will give you a very small prediction. And sometimes it's enough, but for lots of tasks, we really want a bigger prediction. So what we do here, instead of this pooling operation, so why it's so small? It's so small because we use pooling operations here. So here and here, we decrease our resolution. So let's just remove it. So we use the same weights, but instead of strike two convolution or pulling there, we just remove pulling or make stride equal one. Then it's all the same resolution. So in the end, we'll get prediction just eight times smaller than original image. Which for some uh, application is actually good enough. Uh, it's larger resolution. Unfortunately, that will give you bigger computational costs because now here you just you have more spatial bigger spatial resolution. Another way to get bigger uh, output is to use UNet type of structures. There, you first using your pooling and strided convolutions, you go to very small uh, resolution, and then using unpooling that just knows where you pull and then unpool in the same location, or use the convolution, which is opposite operation of convolution. It returned the segments back to their original size. So. The main difference between these two approaches is, so they both use quite often. They sometimes they combined in something in the middle, but usually UNET kind of approaches are used in a places there you can easily encode some uh, low level. So you have some low level shapes. So for example, you segment in cells and then cells have shape, and then you can encode this like shape priors in these levels. And that in these layers. And then it's worked pretty well. But if you have a huge uh, image with uh, global connections, and then it's not clear from a local connective, like from a local context, it's really hard to say what's the right class, then these kind of approaches are working well. So for classic computer vision problems like common objects, uh, uh, common objects or egocentric, like, uh, autonomous writing and so on, people usually use this kind of methods. For tasks where we need to segment cells or some small objects, then people usually rely on UNET kind of architectures. Okay, now that's the basic architectures. In the last four years, we, as computer vision made a significant progress. So we went from 65 intersection of union to 82, which is nowadays the images looks that Result semantic segmentation looks pretty good, and I will show you a few examples. So, what did we learn from this uh, from this improvement? So, first of all, we learned that skip connections are important. So, if you go with this uh, middle point here, the size of your pictures is very spatial resolution is very small, and then you lose a lot of information. So, let's say the object in the very beginning here was less than 32 by 32 pixels. That means that at this point, it will be less than one uh, position in the whole feature map. So using skip connections, so going from here and concatenating or summing up or doing something with it to bring these features here helps recognition quality a lot. So now we have a local context about some high resolution details that we can use. And in the end, it improves performance significantly. Another way, another improvements we have in semantic segmentation is architectures like this. So instead of one unit or like, yeah, there are different uh, ways of calling this stuff. So some people call it unit because of the shape. Some call it hourglass because of the shape. And uh, sometimes they stack it and it works well. So it allows you to go, because of this skip connections here, the original information is still preserved. So we skip it here, now it's here and again and again. And that allows you to several times look at the bigger pictures. Here we look at the bigger picture and now upscale back using some small features and so on. So stacked hourglass in a task where you need 
some very tiny details like key points, uh, segmented finding there's a key point or something like this, then it's super important. So, yeah. Is there any sort of like besides empirical justification for why sexiness helps us do that? Apart from empirical? Yeah. No. <laughs> uh, like, I, I don't like, I know that. I know that previous talk was pretty exciting and that you all got excited about like things, but we're not there yet. <laughs> yeah, I'm very sorry to ruin it now for you, but there is like, we know more now, we know. And like, hopefully our field will mature at some point and we will be able to explain this kind of things. Now, most of his papers, they don't even have, you know, some artificial examples that you show well, because like with synthetic data, you can show that, okay, I have an infinite amount of data and I can see whether it's able to learn something or not able to learn something. And then most of this paper don't even do this thing. So they just show best numbers on our data sets. So it's really hard to tell. Uh, but please listen to me. <laughs> okay, so another problem with, uh, what, so what's important in semantic segmentation? Beyond the skip connections, what is important is context. Context is crucial. So here on this example, if we look on this patch of the play field here, and these patches of grass here, they look the same. So from their uh, immediate neighborhood, the visual appearance is exactly the same. Oh, there are more examples like this, but basically for semantic segmentation to segment this part is a play field and this part is a grass. It needs to know that there is a net here, there is a player here, and so on. So how we can get this kind of bigger context, so see that allow the network, the some local patches in a high resolution here to see the bigger picture, to see the global context. So one solution is to just use a bigger convolution. So here is a 1D example, and we use usually three by three nowadays but we can use seven by seven, 15 by 15, 30 by 30. Unfortunately, that will most likely, first of all, it's hard to train, it is slow, and then it also overfits better. So as soon as you have 30 by 30 convolution, it will start learning exact patterns and you would need a lot to make it not overfit. So instead, there is a solution of dilated or atros uh, convolutions there, uh, we apply it not to the dense neighborhood, but using this R. So I promise that would be the only one formula in my slide. So there will be no other formulas. I think you're disappointed, but yeah, just wanted to uh, get me, give you notice. Okay, so the latent convolutions, we can, it's the same three by three convolution, but instead of applying it in a dense neighborhood, we now look further and we can go further and so on. So in 2D case, it would look like this. So now we have a sparse connection and even though it can't see all the neighborhood, it turns out that this is pretty helpful. And using this kind of architectures now, using some global context, so this like types of things that are useful in semantic segmentation and proven to be very good and improving performance for all unit kind of architectures and for architectures where we just increase the resolution. So this kind of layers where we get a feature map, we apply three by three convolution with different dilation rate. And here dilation rate is crazy. So it's like 18 pixels. So we have center pixel, and then the next pixel will be in 18 pixel uh, distance from it. But this thing is really helpful for semantic segmentation because it gives you, it gives the opportunity for the network to see, to see to the, uh, to the boundaries, to like much bigger, to see the much bigger context. And you can do it with this dilated or atrocious convolutions. Another way is using a pooling. So given a feature map, you do some different poolings. Sometimes you just pull the whole feature map into just one spatial location. So you just sum it up and then you unpull it back. So using that sample and so on. So this is proven to be very useful for semantic segmentation. Now, some details about semantic segmentation. 
So training details as with classification, we just use multinomial logistic regression, even though there's a lot of correlation between different pixels. So it's, they're not independent, but during training, we just treat each pixel independently. And so it's just a multinomial logistic regression in each pixel, absolutely independent. They're just not perfect, but it works. So few things that is important to make it train properly is first of all, class imbalance. So sometimes like in real world data sets, like it's really depends on your data set. Uh, in our community, there are lots of data sets that classes are balanced. So we're trying to see the classes that have more or less the same number of pixels. But if they're imbalanced, now there are lots of tricks you can use. For example, uh, usually people just reweight the loss depending on number, of, uh, depending on the class it uh, aligned with. So another thing which is pretty important is hard samples mining. So if we do autonomous driving, like if we do computer vision for autonomous driving, usually it's pretty easy to segment sky, road, buildings. And because of the, how many pixels on the road, even though the loss there is pretty low, but summing them up, it's a huge gradient signal. And so we want to remove it and that helps a lot. So if you have a class of balance and if you have some samples, some pixels that are much easier than another sample uh, pixels, then it's important to think about. And then with training and testing, it's exactly the same uh, picture as with uh, classification. So data augmentation is the most important thing for you. So you can do cropping, you can do scaling, rotating, color augmentation, whatever, and it helps a lot. So just by doing it, you can improve your performance by 10 relative percent, 20 percent, and yeah, that's important. So here are a few examples for semantic segmentation results. Here are autonomous driving scenarios. It's pretty dark, but yeah, and common objects as well. And in general, if you have enough data, and here enough is actually not a very big number. So for these scenarios, for these scenarios, you need more data because it's very diverse. There are different images, any images actually. So there are images like this, but then images with people. For this kind of images, if you want a semantic simulation to work, you need a lot of uh, like a lot of images. 10k, 20k, 100k would be a good number. But for examples like this, where it's all this egocentric street view, so it's all this you seeing the streets, there is a lot of priors in how streets look like. It's all this road and the down, uh, sky above, buildings here. So there are lots of priors. And actually for this kind of images, for this kind of tasks, and I assume there are more tasks outside of computer vision like this, then the data set might be much smaller. So here you can get very decent results with just 2,000 images. In the last 100,000 images would be enough. So you do severe uh, training time augmentation and the thing will work pretty well. So here, I don't know how well you can see it, but here results are pretty good. Do you sure. label that? Do they use the point position in coding versus the local awareness of a, you know, otherwise kind of you just like filter and you don't really know where they are in the way you can go into the but yeah. uh, There are some papers who show that it is helpful. But in general, even about it, you see that it's, so first of all, the networks as of right now, ResNet and kind of, you, you heard about ResNet, right? So residual networks. So this networks their receptive field is huge. So that means that it goes beyond the image itself. And then it sees the zeros that you pad your image. And now actually ResNet can figure out where like this pixel, is uh, position, even the, the valid position on coding, because it knows how far away, it basically can detect the corners, because corners, it's where zeros start outside the image. Because it knows where it is, it can actually calculate the posi like its position in coding. So even the valid explicit position in coding, SGD will do everything for you. So that's a uh, beauty. So, uh, well, beauty, and at the same time, it's very hard to debug. 
because SGD will do whatever, like you do a mistake and then stochastic gradient descent will fix it somehow. So yeah, position encoding is important, yet it works without it. And then you can clearly see that it, it prefer, even like if you do like complete gibberish image, so with something like strange and like, I don't know, you completely like blur it with a huge Gaussian filter, it still will prefer to say sky above and road below. So it's able to do some kind of positional set, uh, positional coding itself. It is a problem, like glass is very hard problem when we're talking about 3D reconstruction because then like it's not good. Depth estimation, because glass messes up there. Here, we talk about recognition and the worst thing that can happen and usually happens is if something is reflected, in the glass, it will segment what was reflected. So if I see there, if you see reflection on a huge building with a properly, like people there, it will segment it as a people there and not as a glass. So that can happen. But in general, recognition, like recognition problems, they don't care about your glass. So they just, glasses are okay. They just look in the bigger pictures. They know that cars do have glass there. So that's the thing. Like, uh, 3D methods that try to, you know, reason about how our world is 3D, how things should be traced, how race should be traced, and so on. There it's important because for this kind of models of our world, that's confusing. Here, we don't have model at all. So here we just, it's a pure convolutional based recognition model that you do not put any priors in it. And that it knows that there are windows uh, in a car and it just segments them properly, usually, but sometimes not. Hourglass, as I showed, like stacked hourglass is a meta architecture. And there are not hundreds, but like tens of papers, like doing something with stacked hourglass uh, um, architectures. I've seen a few that did this context thing not only on each stack, on each stack hourglass, but on each skip connection and like basically putting more than less. And then it's improved their performance there. In general, like you want it in the end. So basically you get a good concepts, what is what, like some local in information, and then you want to use it somehow later. So it might be, doesn't make a lot of sense to put it in the very beginning. But then later, yeah, I, I, I haven't seen any examples there. It hurts, but that's a problem with a community, you know, negative bias, so positive biasing, right? So you never know what actually didn't work. So that's why I don't know. But I've seen lots of context models put everywhere. Why do we do pooling in general? So first of all, it gives you some invariance to some small perturbation, right? Because if you use max pooling and like two by two, you can actually shift the image a bit by one pixel and it will not change anything. But also we do pooling right now to make our resolution smaller, to be able to increase our channel dimension. Because if we don't do pooling, we still have like an increased channel dimension that will increase the how much memory do we need? And that's not efficient. We can't fit everything in GPU. Right now, most of the state-of-the-art networks, they usually don't use pulling at all, but they use strided convolutions. So instead of three by three convolution applied on each location, they apply three by three convolution, then moving not one pixel, but two pixels and apply it again. So usually to reduce dimension, which is important, People use strided convolutions. Pooling as well. Uh, where to put pooling? Hard question. So the hand-designed networks, they have like usually five stages, like going from a original image to a smaller, 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 up to 32. With, uh, it's, it's, it does depend on it, definitely. So for classification networks, you don't need a lot of, uh, you don't need stages to be very big in very beginning with high resolution. You want to go to smaller resolution faster and then do more computations here. So you would put 
pulling very short, like in very beginning of the network to get to a smaller resolution and then like get to the answer. If we're talking about semantic segmentation, then actually it's pretty important to think about like to, to work with high resolution images. So it's actually the raw papers that shows that it's better to have bigger stages in the beginning of the network with bigger resolution but less number of channels and then like putting these polling layers a bit later. So it's task dependent. It's really like whether all the information is like context information that like you need to uh, process later with like seeing everything or there is a lot of local details that you need to process in a high resolution. So that's, there is, I don't know like real rule of thumb, but yeah, that's how it is. I hope that was somehow helpful. Okay, any other questions? Okay, so beyond, so that's a semantic simulation result as computer vision scientists or researcher see them. Now we can go further and instead of 2D, we can use 3D data. So nothing, nothing has changed. So instead of two, we use the same, exact same architectures, but instead 2D convolutions, we use 3D convolutions. And the rough papers that are doing it for usual objects and the 3D volumes, there are also physicists who are trying to do the same thing as a 3D uh, space. The problem with 3D is all this memory efficient, like memory, you don't have enough memory and computational efficiency. So for images like this, for 3D volumes like this, there are lots of void space. There are nothing actually happening there. So for that, there are special sparse convolutions or manifold convolutions that allow you to actually work only in the places where things are and then do not do anything anywhere else. So actually semantic simulation can be applied to all kind of data as well. Okay, so that's it with a semantic segmentation and we go into bounding box object detection. And as I said, we're trying to find all objects of certain classes and delineate them with the boxes. So let's start with a kitten. So it's an image classification, the same cat. Uh, in image classification, we just answer the question, what? In bounding box detection, object detection, we ask, we answer questions what in where, not to the pixel extent, but to the bounding box extent. Okay, and the same way we did it with semantic segmentation in the very beginning by applying the same classification image everywhere, we can do the same thing here. So let's assume that we know that on each image there is just one object. So we need to classify it, know what it is it, and where is it? Then we just apply our classification network. And in the end, instead of just class prediction, we also add another head that would predict our box coordinates. So that's just four numbers. And now we have two losses. One is a classification prediction, which is cross entropy or multinomial logistic regression, and bounding box loss, which is usually just a regression loss. Usually, people in bounding box detection, People either use smooth loss, a smooth L1 loss, or just L1 loss, Huber loss somehow, but sometimes, but usually just L1 loss there. Okay, with one object, it's pretty clear. What if we have multiple objects in our image? So first we can use some heuristic to generate proposals. There are lots of pre-deep learning ways to basically on the image find the blobs that looks like it can be something and then just say okay that's a proposal we'll be talking about proposals a bit later so now using this representation uh we take each proposal we crop the image there and the proposal we wrap it to be the size where our classification network wants it to be and then we predict class pre like we do predict class or background now because some proposals might be bad, so it's just like nothing there. And we again predict four numbers here. And now as we have proposals, it's not just four absolute numbers, but usually it just deltas how proposal box needs to be changed to get the, uh, to get the right prediction as a bound box. Okay, so 
with appearance of deep learning, this kind of model. So that's a general idea how object detection works, like how object detection methods works. We will go in details how some state of art method works. But in general, with appearance of deep learning for some classic computer vision data set, without deep learning and after deep learning, we get 3x improvement in AP. But that didn't stop there. And through this four years, we get another 3x improvement as well. So we making our detection models much more sophisticated and its performance increased a lot. So here I will not talk about the, you know, the whole history of object detection approaches. I will not go like what we used like five years ago that was silly and what like and how we get from there to here. I will just explain general faster RCNN approach, which is de facto the leading approach right now, all new advances are built on top of this one. So I will not go with the whole history, how we get to faster ours. So, okay, we have an image and we do some pre-image comp per image computation. So it's just our FCN, the same thing, fully convolutional part of the network that given an image, produce some features that somehow explain the image. Now, next step, from these features, we use RPN, which is region proposal network, that given these features, predict possible locations for objects. How we do it? Given the features, uh, I promised you some non-cats, here it is. <laughs> so given feature map, uh, we go through the whole points in the feature map. For each point, we say like, how likely this point is like that there is an object in this point and we predict so we predict probability of object and we predict also proposal box so rpn usually is a very lightweighted thing so it's like one three by three convolution something like this based on these features we just predict bunch of proposals and then like crop them based on object score now using these proposals we need to do the same thing we did with usual RCNN with an image itself. So given the proposal, we went to image, we cropped it, wrap it, and go up. Uh, here, we don't go back to the image, but using proposals, we try to crop feature map from this, like we try to crop from exact feature map. How we do it? We get our proposal, we get a feature map. We know that in the end, we want all proposals in respect of their size to have the same representation to then figure out what class it is. So for that, we need to have the same spatial resolution for any object with like without respect of their scale. So how we do it, we get a proposal, we get, oh, we get some grid there. We try to get the even grid, but because we use average pulling on top, so each cell like these two pixels, will get average pulled to this location. Because we use pixels, and sometimes discretization can't be made perfectly here. We have like some errors here like this, but we need to have them, and we have four by four. That's ROI pull idea. Well, nowadays there are better ways, ROI aligned, that actually recognize that this discretization problem is indeed a problem that gives you worse performance. And they try to pull not real pixels, but some interpolated uh, values from inside this box. So that's a bit of a details, but yeah. So the most important part, given any proposal, we crop from the feature map some, some part, and then using average pooling or max pooling, we get any proposals, all proposals to the same spatial resolution. So after that, we can batch all the region proposals back ROI, ROI pool by ROI pool, ROI is region of interest. Now we can put all our proposals to the batch. So now instead of image dimension before, now our batch of image dimension of batch size was number of images. Now our batch size is number of regions. Using these features, we just apply multi-layer perceptron. So few fully connected layers to get from there to, again, 
softmax classification, so class prediction, and box regression. So we predict uh, the shifts from this proposal to the best, uh, to the predicted box. So that's an overview of the whole framework. That's how most of the detection methods nowadays works. So they first use proposals to predict some things that might be an object, and then use a pooling scheme to get the features to the same size to predict whether it was a real object and what's the shift from a proposal. Few problems here. First of all, each region is, proposed, uh, is processed independently. And that means if we had proposals, very similar proposals for the horse, that means like both detections might survive. So usual output of the network would look like this. So there is a person and a horse there, and there will be two different uh, detections for person, two different, oh, sometimes more, sometimes 100 predictions for the same object. So in order to remove them, we use some simple post-processing heuristic based on the class, uh, class score. So how sure our classification prediction, how sure it is this is the right box. And using non-maximal suppression, we suppress predictions with a lower score. That's a complete heuristic, and the wrap papers nowadays that are trying to do it smarter, trying to utilize all the predictions to refine the final prediction and so on. But this is a basic approach, and it works pretty well. So uh, getting smart here will give you another point or two, but not much. Okay, so that's a whole framework. Uh, this thing, and then non-maximum suppression on top. One important part, uh, is any, like, any questions so far? Yes. Oh, yeah, you about, yeah, non-maximum suppression, definitely this heuristic will ruin things for this kind of cases. So if it's a huge occlusion, and then occlusion the way that, like, you know, boundary box. So for example, I'm, I'm looking like an S, and there is a person here, oh, boundary boxes are very similar and then they will be suppressed. But if we stay in close to another person, then the thresholds are there put so that usually they will not be suppressed. But you're right, sometimes it does happen. So it's a simple heuristic, and there are ways of doing it smarter nowadays. Like you have all these boxes, now you get features again for them, and you try to figure out which one should be left. Okay. One important part of faster and so all this development so what else missing to get the state of art system the important system the important thing called fpm feature permit network that produce features with a different scales so and i will explain it in a bit more details so in object detection as with semantic segmentation context matter a lot for object detection scale matter a lot so we need to predict there might be person close to, to the camera, and then it will be a huge person. There might be a person far, far away from a camera. Then it's a, a bunch, like small handful of pixels that you still need to recognize as a person. So scale matter a lot. And we need our detectors need to classify objects in the like in the huge different scales. And here, if we have just one thing here, then one proposal, huge one, might get a few, like a lot of features, then the super small object might be super small here, and then not much information saved there. So instead, feature permit network is a one solution, not ideal, but it improves the ability of the detection network to get scale right. So what are options in general? So we realize that scale is a problem for us. What our options are? So first of all, the option that was used for ages in computer vision, it just used picturized image parameter. So try to predict the same thing for image of the same image, just rescaling it lots of times. And that's a Viola Jones, Hawk filters, and so on. So all classic computer vision techniques, they use this kind of approach. Unfortunately for us, it would mean that we need to apply our convolutional neural network several times and that's not efficient. In our approach is to leave it all to the features. So saying that, okay, features SGD, and SGD will help us to get the good features 
in the top. So with a small resolution, we still will be able to get big, uh, like small objects there. Unfortunately, while there are lots of works that are doing it, performance is not so great. And you can see that scaling is an issue for this kind of approach. So SGD doesn't help us that much here. Another approach also used very, like a lot recently, uh, I would say not last two years, but before, people were using a uh, pyramid feature hierarchy. So they basically do prediction not using the last features, but they also use features before pulling stratified convolutions. They, they had earlier in our network, they, they not as good in terms of features. So they haven't seen much. There wasn't a lot of convolutions yet. So they have a very, they just not as strong features but there is a higher resolution in it. And people do use it, it's fast. Unfortunately, quite suboptimal and small objects are still get missing. So FPN is a remedy, Feature Pyramid Network is a remedy for all of it. And it looks a lot like UNet. And the main idea is we have a huge classification network here. Let's, having these features, let's go back and get feature maps on different sp spatial resolutions, but they all would have a global context. So for that, we go back using skip connection, but here, this decoder part that goes from a small resolution to bigger resolution, unlike usual unit architectures, that's also quite heavy, this thing is very simple. So going with a, from a smaller resolution to bigger resolution, we just upsample our features, and then using Y by one convolution from here, we go here. So this picture does not actually represent that this part is much heavier. It's a whole classification network. And here we have just a few convolutions. So it's quite lightweighted addition. But in the end, what we have, we have feature maps that are on different with spatial resolution that all have a strong information from this uh, feature maps that's in the whole image and had a bunch of conclusions before them. So, okay, that's a, a FPN. It, it's suboptimal still, because we have this feature maps, they're not all possible feature maps, it's just a few scales. But in the end, what we do, we add it here. So instead of just one feature map, which is small, we get feature maps with different resolution. And then based on proposal size, so if it's a huge proposal, then we crop it from a smaller feature pyramid, like from a higher scale of the feature pyramid. And if it's a tiny, tiny object, then we will crop it from here. And it turns out that this thing improves performance significantly. So this now is a final faster RCNN plus FPN pipeline. And in the last two or three years, FPN, faster RCN, FPN, is a foundation for all challenge for object detection uh, challenges. So in computer vision, we are metric driven. So there are lots of challenges. And then people basically push all in. So they use a lot of computation, they use all data augmentation, they use everything, unsampling and so on. And that kind of competition there, you can see which model can be pushed to the like best possible accuracy and which cannot be. So. And as we see in the last few years, faster RCNN plus FPN is a part of foundation of all approaches. So that's a good thing to start off from. I haven't covered all new techniques on top of faster RCNN plus FPN. There are plenty, they're different. They're addressing different problems in object detection. But in general, if you need object detection in your uh, field, then faster RCNN plus FPN is the right thing to start from. Now, some people do use it already. So physicists, again, do not ask me what happened on these images, but I definitely seen that they use faster in it to produce these things. Okay, so slides will be online so you could read it actually. Okay, so that's it for boundary box detection. What I didn't cover in this part of the topic, I didn't cover single stage detectors. So the detectors that remember we had a proposal stage that gave us a handful of proposals and then some network on top of it, small one, but still powerful network that 
basically improve these proposals. So there are single stage detectors that are trying to do everything with basically one proposal. So proposal, uh, RPN proposal, uh, region proposal network would give you the output, the final output. So the plus thing, they're much faster. The downside is they're not as good in terms of recognition power because they need to predict the exact bounding box using these features and no specific per object computation. So everything is conditioned. So the worst performance, but if you're about speed and what is important for you is, you know, process data on the fly, then this kind of tech, you should look in this kind of technique and there are few links there. Starting from there, you will find a good methods for your problem. Okay, uh, any questions about bounding box detection so far? No? Okay, I'll go for it. So instant segmentation. Instant segmentation is a simple addition to bounding box detection. Instead of just bounding boxes, we try to delineate objects with their masks. Now, uh, yeah, and usually for each segment, not usually, but always for each segment, we just can get a bounding box around it, right? And our mask is a basically prediction inside each bounding box. That means that we can just add another head and faster center because all predictions, all we need to do here is to get a mask inside bounding box. Faster CNN in the end do prediction per each region. So that's ideal case for us. And that's what we do. So that's a faster CNN uh, pipeline. The same thing, FB, uh, FBN gives us the features here. Then RPN gives us proposals. Then we use ROI line, which is a fancier version of ROI pool to get features. MLP, so, uh, cl class prediction box regression. Now we add another head that might use the same features or features with a bigger, higher resolution. We use fully convolutional network, so it can be a small network that produces segmentation that predicts our mask per, per each proposal bounded box. So that's a simple head. You can do what on inference, what you can do using this part, you predicted class and box. Now using this box, this box is usually much more uh, precise than our proposal. So we can feed this box back and using this box instead of proposal to get ROI aligned, to get better, preciser, more precise features here. And if using FCN, we predict the mask there. Uh, yes, yeah, yeah, definitely. So it does improve. So multi, so here we have a uh, lots of losses. We just sum them up. It does work better. So usually why do we need to predict box because yeah yeah no because the thing is that in the end even if you don't use cascaded cascaded approach and there are cascaded approaches that go much more convoluted than this doing like cascade several times and so on but even without it predicted mask based on proposal now the question where to paste it back so where it is on the image and you can paste it back to the proposal thing, but sometimes it's better to use this box to paste it back to the box. Not always. So usually, to be honest, like as soon as people come up with Moscow Sand, they started to use this thing, and it is better. Uh, even though it's the, one of the most important rules with like CNNs and deep learning is whatever you do on train, do exactly the same thing on test. So if you do that differently, that might break things. So if you do some bug there, SGD helped you to remedy it, but if it's not the same thing you're in inference, it will be bad. So even though that's, we, we, we break in this rule here and you're in inference, we do something different, but because this box is much more precise than proposal, that helps us. So yeah. Important thing here, as again, as all our features have the same resolution. A respect of size of the proposal, we always have the same masks 28 by 28. That's the way like how it looks. Again, the same thing. I don't know whether you need it, but 
features, ROI aligned to get these features, few convolutions, predicted masks, all these 28 by 28. How these masks look like? So given an image, given a proposal box, it gives you a 28 by 28 mask all the time. It doesn't matter how big is actual object. So if your proposal is worse, then your mask will be shifted like this. So that's harder to predict. And then like other examples, the couch there with a bad proposal. So it, uh, like it, it missed lots of uh, big part of the couch, but that's what we have. And yeah, human. Okay, so that's the loss, how we get our mask for our loss. And we use usual semantic signification to uh, learn this thing there. Now, what we do in the inference part, so we predicted our, so given this image, given the person there, uh, we got our prediction 28 by 28. Then we resize it back to the size of the boundary box we had and trash hold it. And then we get the output for our person. So that's how mask RCN, not past RCN, but mask RCN works in general. So here are a few examples. You can see that even though it works on 28 by 28 size and in general should be pretty low resolution because of this trick here, because we upscale soft predictions and not like binary masks yet, because that's a prediction like how likely there is a person there, we get actually bigger resolution than effectively bigger resolution than 28 by 28. And here you can see examples that people are segmented. Not perfectly, you still can see bad examples here, but pretty well. And here's another example with people and table and like segmented out. Okay, uh, what wasn't covered in instant segmentation part? So Maskersen, again, if you wanna do instant segmentation in computer vision, Maskersen is your friend. Again, two, three last years, all best solutions and all challenges do use Maskersen. So that is the best thing. If you gonna want to go faster, if pixel level accuracy is much more important for you for the recognition. So if you're okay with missing some small objects, but what is important for you to segment each pixel for the object that you do find, then there are other methods. And usually overall they call bottom-up approaches to instant segmentation. Unlike mask RCN or fast RCN, which is top-down, we first find proposals. And then we do something for each proposal independent. Bottom-up approaches are doing it other way around. They first do semantic segmentation for the whole image. So we do not distinguish different, ob different objects of the same class. And then we group instances using some additional information. Or we do not learn semantic segmentation. And first then, we just for each pixel, we learn some embedding and then use clustering to group them. So there are methods like this. They can be faster though not all these, but in general, the recognition power is a bit lower than with mask RCN. But sometimes pixel level accuracy is better. Okay, uh, any questions about instant segmentation? Good. Uh, now I will skip panoptic segmentation for a second and I'll talk about more. What is there more? So. In general, the same thing is with instant segmentation. If you have some per object annotation, so they just inside bounding box, then you can just add another head to the mask RCN pipeline. So for example, pose uh, estimation, having a, uh, having a people there, you get this key, we call it key points or joins of the people. And then it's just another head. So we have a head that predicts classes and boxes. And now we predict a basically semantic segmentation that predicts the location of each key point for the person. So I will not go into details how exactly you get this, like how the head looks like, but it's again, usual semantic segmentation head that predicts this kind of thing. And that's a result. Uh, it is so slow because of my laptop, like the actual frame rate is. All right, so you can see that it's, it's doing the job pretty well, even though the he, like the person here is doing, like the joints are moving not in a usual way, and it's a harder task, but it's still doing a pretty well, good job. 
manual annotation. So here, like, I haven't mentioned it in the very beginning, but the whole talk is about supervised training. So we always have data with Groundhog. And whenever we train some, in my talk, whenever we train something, there is a Groundhog. So here, there were trained mechanical torques that see, seeing like how we put the joints. There are just a few joints and there are easy joints like ice, like people do know where ice are, but there are papers doing it. There are papers now, more and more papers doing things like this, but this thing is with manual animation. So, but yeah, you're right. And there are, there, there is a lot of like, the trend in computer vision in general right now is to go away from supervised training. It is not there yet. We still use a lot of supervision, but in general, lots of new papers are trying to do something with synthetic data. Kinect is not still not synthetic. We can go more synthetic from there, but yeah, people trying to do stuff. So any questions about this one? No. Yeah. Uh, the question was, will it fail if it's an amputee and there is a no limb? It can. But in general, the thing is that all predictions here are independent. So again, as with glass, we don't have priors. So it learns some priors, but if there is no, uh, no support from a visual appearance, it will not predict it. And, you know, with amputees, I think the thing is that there are lots of examples that people are occluded. So it's pretty natural. And in ground truth, there are lots of examples that people, like, only half of the key points visible. So I think it, like, I don't know, I haven't seen examples, but it might fail. But in general, it, like, heavily rely on visual appearance, and it doesn't have priors. We do not force it. To predict the whole person and that's like for the old days like 10 years ago people were still interested in this problem and then definitely you will have this problem here it's like whatever you have in your training data. any other questions okay so if you somehow not happy with key points you want something more then we can go to dance pose so here instead of predicting just key points for each person there, we predict correspondence for each point on the person. We predict correspondence of this point to some canonical shape of the person. And again, that's just another head. So for each proposal, we use convolution that predicts UV coordinates. It's a way to flatten out this 3D shape. And yeah, an example how it actually works. You can see it works pretty well. The rep, uh, that's actually like two years ago, I think. Right now, they're better. So how they collected uh, this annotation, it was basically, uh, you, you can't collect this kind of annotation. So they collected much more density than, uh, than key points and then interpolated. So, in a sense, it works here. I don't have, unfortunately, videos, but what, how you can use this thing, you can now, having a whole human body, you can now transfer the, the textures from one person to another person. So, huh? Yeah, so if you have a person like who dressed as a cowboy, now you can put like the same texture to any person. So if you have a 3D, texture for one person, you can put it to another one. And it looks funny. It's not perfect. You still like, it's far away from like being realistic, but it looks fun. This. Sure. This is one camera thing. So all I'm talking about now is single view. So if you have a stereo video, yeah. It could be better, uh, it, and it definitely will be. Any additional information will help us. Uh, the problem right now, there are not many data sets with this kind of information, with this kind of ground. 
So there are lots of stereo data sets, but then there is no ground truth like this. So we, we work with whatever we have. And right now it's images with just like single view. Yeah. Yeah, so that's why I think we'll, we're going there. So, you know, for example, Daimler, who are doing Mercedes uh, as a vehicles, they collected a huge data set of autonomous driving and released it to, 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 to scientific community. So not only them, but like, not like from, from, from one point for this private company, why they would release their data, because then everyone can train their autonomous driving scenarios. But at the same time, it boosted our research quite a lot. And now there are like many more methods that wouldn't appear without this data. So now as this cameras, like multi-camera setups appearing on the phones, there will be more companies collecting this data because data collecting is expensive because you need to annotate it and so on. So more like I think nowadays, as you're right, and these cameras are more and more common, these companies will uh, share more data and we'll be working on them and there will be cool methods that are doing this in a multi-view scenario. Yeah. It, there is no information passed between frames at all. Yes, it can. So usually, so that's a pretty hot topic as of right now, because like there are more and more data sets that have this kind of data. So right now, what people would do, they first of all will collect features from neighboring frames so, and will still do prediction per frame. Or what they will do, you already had sequential like RNN lecture about sequential methods, right? So they would predict something on the previous frame and then we'll use these predictions as a priors for the next frame. So things like that. So this is the things that I'm working right now. There are more papers appearing and yeah, but in general, like majority of computer vision still focuses on one image and yeah. So this, all these images without any temporal smoothing. And like, even without temporal smoothing, it's like, yeah, you see it's flickery with a hard cases with uh, a lot of occlusions, but in general, in this kind of data, it's pretty stable, even without temporal information. Even though with temporal information, it would be better. Okay, now, if you're not happy with 2D masks, we can go further. Again, within 2D mask, if we have annotation for 3D shapes of the objects, instead of just mask, we can predict voxel grids. And then from voxels grid, we can predict meshes. How exactly we do it, I will not go into much details here, but you can do it because it's just one box, but like, because it's again, pair box computation. So you just add another hat. It can be very complex, but still one hat. Okay. And now I'll be talking about panoptic segmentation, which is what computer vision field started to work fairly recently. Again, I'll explain what does it mean. So image segmentation tasks in the last two years looks like this. So there is an instant segmentation there. We try to segment each thing and segment it with a mask and different people will have the different masks and semantic segmentation, where we try to segment everything, but then all people here will have the same segment. And for someone outside of computer vision, that is actually quite surprising. Like, why this two task, like, why image segmentation is not both of them. But that's a lots of historical reasons. And first of all, that's because it's easier to solve it that way. So there are easier, and there are lots of methods improving like on one of these parts. But in general, for real world applications, you likely, in computer vision, you will likely need both of them. So I have a few illustrations here. So let's say you have just instant segmentation. Here you have, it's a real prediction. You have a person's keys. And like given that information, you know, okay, I have a skis. So it's either cross country skiing or mountain skiing 
And this probably kid here, uh, I don't know, this probably kids something. So you don't know what's the general scene layout look like. But if we add semantic segmentation at the same time, it would give us much more information. So now we see that it's not a kid, but it's actually a person lying in the middle of the sky with kids. And we now have much more information about general geometrical layout of the scene. And uh, overlaying it with an actual image, we see that going from here to there is not, not a big difference. So we knew about this scene a lot. The same uh, true if we go other way around. So if we have just semantic simulation, it's enough if we want to know where we can drive. So what is the road and what is the payment? But here we need to reason about individual objects if we want to drive safely. So here we need to know whether like this blob of people wants to cross the road or not. And for that, you would need instance segmentation as well. So combined, it will give you more information. Again, here it's a real prediction. Given this information, you know much more about this actual scene. So that's why uh, I think for practical approaches in computer vision, usually you would anyway need both semantic segmentation and instance segmentation together. That's why we consider a unified segmentation task uh, where the task is to segment with a semantic segmentation all stuff classes, categories without the notion of instances. For example, grass, river, sky, trees, sometimes yes, sometimes not. And things categories like people or boats that we clearly can segment different instances separately. This is not the new task for computer vision. So we've been trying to address it because it's clear that it's useful for applications. We've been trying to address it several times in the past years, but uh, because there was no enough data, there was no data sets with both semantic segmentation and segmentation, there was no metrics, for that, so like every time the new paper appear, progress stopped there. So, and very recently we proposed the panoptic simulation. Their panoptic means seeing everything at once. And in this case, we now the field is much more mature. We have more data sets. We have data sets with semantic simulation and this is segmentation. We have we come up with a new matrix that allow you because computer vision is metric driven. So we need metrics there. And yeah, now the field is growing and people are interested in this kind of task. So how to solve this kind of task? And the first approach is a very naive approach. Uh, we just get an input. We use whatever is your best semantic segmentation network to get semantic segmentation. The best instance segmentation method to get your instance segmentation. And then using some heuristic combine them together into panoptic segmentation. So why do you need heuristic? Because Matsker Sen, for example, it predicts objects that can overlap. Here we actually cannot allow any overlapping. It's closer to semantic segmentation, so you need some heuristic. And recently, uh, so using the two networks, it's possible, but it's very inefficient. You can't put it into one GPU, and actually you can't improve this architecture much more. So that's why currently most of the panoptic segmentation methods based on this kind of approach. So we use the same feature pyramid network that having a classification backbone first and then using some light weighted decoder to get features on different scales. What we do using these features, we use Masker SAN that can predict instant segmentation and then using the same features we combine them together and predict the semantic segmentation from the same kind of features. Surprisingly, I will not go to the details of how this method works and so on. First of all, it's not yet another RCN and framework had, so because it's not per proposal, but here this kind of pixel level recognition had works with a whole image there. And this thing, I will not go to the details of performance and so on, but we can see that this kind of approach can deliver state-of-the-art results both for instant segmentation and semantic segmentation at the same time. 
uh, we can see some results there. Yeah, people have like the same class will have the same color, but they will be separated with, uh, with boundaries. So we can see that combination works. Sometimes it fails, but it works reasonable. There are more examples. And yeah, this kind of topic, I don't know whether it's very useful for research purposes, but panoptic simulation right now gets a lot of traction. And from this baseline approach, people do start to innovate and come up with a new architecture. So I will not cover them into much details, but yeah, there are people trying to see how we can, can combine this region-based approach that we see each region independently and combine it with a whole picture approaches that are trying to see the whole image at once. And I think that's it. I'm a bit earlier. So if you have any questions, so we covered different recognition uh, tasks that computer vision build facing. Uh, and yeah, thank you.